Welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley and I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Freight Waves. We are excited to be here and are happy to be presenting this month's market update webinar in partnership with Convoy, which is dedicated to utilizing technology to bring reliability, transparency, insights, and efficiency to the trucking and supply chain industry. Today's market webinar is going to touch on some of the latest developments affecting freight, particularly as we head into the holiday season and look toward 2019. We'll be hearing from FreightWave CEO Craig Fuller, as well as our Chief Economist Ibrahim Bayan. And before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to reach out to our team via the chat function in your Zoom control panel. Also, if you have questions for our speakers today, type those through the Q&A box in your control panel and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for at the end of the speaker presentations. And we will also be sending out a link to the recording and slide deck for today's presentation if you're not able to view it live or want to share it with your colleagues. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Craig. Ibrahim, I am so excited. This is Craig Fuller and Ibrahim with me. Uh, excited to be back here after the holidays. Great to be back, Craig. You doing all right? Absolutely. So we have a lot to talk about today. There's been a lot going on, a lot of anxiety. Um, I do want to congratulate Convoy and actually all of the Freight Tech 100 and Freight Tech 25. Convoy uh, was recognized as number four uh, as a uh, most innovative company uh, as the uh, a panel of judges. Now, one thing to be clear is we did not choose those solely. That was chosen by uh, a selection of judges. So congratulations to Convoy uh, and their success in changing and creating innovations for the freight market. So really excited to dive in today um, as we'll get started. So, so today's agenda is we're going to go through recent performance, uh, dive into the 2019 outlook, uh, uh, talk about trends in capacity and rates, and then discuss more regional granularity and trends. Uh, I'm Craig Fuller. I'm the CEO and founder of FreightWaves. Uh, I am uh, flanked here by our chief economist, uh, Ibrahim Bayan. Uh, yes, I'm Ibrahim Bayan. I'm just uh, the, the chief economist here. I deal with macroeconomic trends and how they affect transportation markets. So a little bit about FreightWaves, um, we are building a community, continue to build it, uh, that uses data and technology to help companies understand, analyze, react, forecast, and ultimately de-risk the market. So uh, excited about what's happening and, and where this takes us. A little bit behind the scenes, uh, we have actually uh, up to 12 market reporters. We're adding three more in the next uh, month, uh, so we're really excited about that. Two full-time economists, five PhDs, and uh, gaining a lot of traction on the market um, as we as we scale. <laughs> so we'll get started there. I think we're we're good to go. Yeah. So you know, normally when Craig and I do these, we we t we typically focus on like the events that have happened over the last month and how they affect freight markets. I wanted to take a bit of a different approach this time and step back a little bit as we head into 2019, just to take a look and see where we are uh, as far as the economy is concerned, as far as the industry is concerned to help better frame how 2019 is going to look. Uh, so I started with this, this picture of gross domestic product, which is just all the output that the US economy produces. Um, there's a trend line here uh, at about two and a half percent. This is what I consider just average growth for the US economy. And the one thing I wanted to, to, I wanted to bring out is that really since the third quarter of 2017, you can see that the economy has been growing better than, than average. Um, you know, this faster pace of growth has helped absorb a lot of the remaining slack that's in the economy, uh, and it's, it's created a very tight uh, economic environment, and I think that's going to play out as you head into 2019 as well. You can also take a look at sort of uh, how close the U.S. economy is to capacity by looking at employment at the labor market. Now, most people focus on the unemployment rate. That's at uh, multi-decade lows. In fact, it's, it's the lowest it's been since uh, 1969 at 3.7%. I actually like to focus on broader measures of unemployment, which include people that like uh, that are discouraged from working and, and have decided to quit the labor force, or people that are employed part-time that would be ra rather be employed full-time. So the blue line here is is uh, what they call the U6 unemployment rate, which includes all these other sort of fringe workers in the labor force. And the one thing I wanted to bring out is that, you know, the unemployment rate is low, but really even these broader measures of under, underemployment um, are also starting to get closer to normal levels. And what's been happening over the last year is that as the unemployment rate dipped near these historical lows, 
the real gains in the labor market have come from bringing people off of the sidelines and back into the labor force. So people that had kind of given up hope on the labor market have rejoined. Um, but even those kind of measures that include all these people that are on the fringes are getting closer to more normal levels. And what this means is that there really isn't a whole lot of slack left in the economy overall. And so I think like a lot of, you know, the, the, the trucking industry is very familiar with this because the employment market within trucking has been very tight all throughout 2018. But I think this is going to start to play out more and more in other industries as just labor markets in general get very tight. And so what does this mean for the business cycle? Now, normally when you get unemployment that's as low as it is now, um, where you have, where it's falling below what most people consider to be like the natural rate of unemployment, 80% chance of recession within the next three years. So if you look back in history, these kind of periods of, of low uh, unemployment are, are typically followed by some kind of contraction in the economy. And in fact, when you look at like most economists consensus projections, for when the next recession is going to be, they'll tell you it's like around 2020. And part of the reason for that is because they look back in history and say, well, unemployment crossed below 4% sometime in 2017. Three years after that, there should be like a recession somewhere in 2020. Um, and I, I typically, like, I don't follow the idea that just like, just because the, the, the expansion is getting kind of old and the labor market's tight, that means a, a recession is definitely coming. Um, there's a famous quote by, uh, by an economist named uh, Rudy Dernborsch that says, none of the post-war recessions died of old age. They all get murdered. <laughs> now, I mean, he used that as a, like a, a critique of Federal Reserve policy. But the broader principle is that like there has to be some kind of shock in most cases that pushes the economy into recession. It's not enough to just say that like the economy's old, therefore the the the, the, the expansion's old, therefore a recession's coming. So so you don't buy the fact, and I'm interrupting, but I had to ask this question. You don't buy the fact that we've had sort of this long, long, long cycle. Inevitably, you're going to have a recession at some point, right? But but it doesn't matter how long the expansion goes. No, I mean, I, 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 there's no reason to believe that like an expansion can't go on past where it is now. Like what, what, once we get to June of next year, this will be the longest expansion on record. Right. But there's no reason to say, well, it, now it's the longest. So therefore, there's a recession coming in the next year. Um, usually there has to be something that pushes the economy into recession. And the good news is like a lot of the things that typically push the U.S. economy into recession in the past. Uh, the, the U.S. economy has kind of uh, insulated itself against uh, over over the last decade or so. Like the emergence of the energy industry within the U.S. economy has given it a bit of a buffer against something that ordinarily would would be one of the catalysts for a recession. Um, so I, I think the idea that the the economy has gotten a, a lot di a lot more diverse makes it a little bit less likely that there's going to be like a full fledged recession. Um, I think it's much more likely that you get like a recession in sectors of the economy, like maybe the industrial section sector gets a downturn or the housing sector gets a downturn, but not necessarily like the expansion overall is, it comes to an end. So in your view, a recession is not inevitable is what you're saying? I mean, eventually it's going to happen, but it's, <laughs> the point is that it has to be caused by something, uh, and not just the fact that it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's just that the expansion has gotten long in the tooth. Um, so looking at the growth outlook for 2019, um, you, you know, you can see kind of this accelerating pattern in GDP growth that I brought up earlier, uh, helped along in 2018 by a lot of fiscal stimulus. So, you know, we got the tax cut at the beginning of this year, also a package of, of, of government spending that came along with, the, with passing the government budget that helped 2018 growth. You're going to start to see some of that die down next year, like there's not another tax cut that's in the, in the works for 2019. There is still some additional fiscal spending that's going to take place uh, next year, uh, which should help uh, boost growth a, a little bit further. Um, but I think as you move towards the end of you know, the second half of 2019 into 2020, you're going to start to see the economy uh, trend down towards this sort of long term uh, growth trend. Uh, and so we have projections of 2.6% growth next year, uh, slowing down even further to 2.1% in 2020, given the current, uh, the current outlook. So just to take a look at some of the key drivers of, of uh, freight demand, um, I typically like to start with the industrial sector just because it drives so much of freight activity in the economy. Uh, you know, recent performance has been very, very good in, in, uh, in the industrial sector. You can see uh, an industrial production growth here. It hit multi-year highs earlier this year. It's, not, it's, it's dipped down a little bit over the past couple of months, uh, but most of that is because you just get tougher com uh, comparisons to last year. It's not necessarily that like the industrial sector is slowing down. Uh, it's just that, you know, the year-over-year -year growth rates are coming down a little bit. 
Um, it's been helped along the way by just strong domestic demand. Generally healthy global growth over the past year has helped boost uh, industrial activity. Uh, and it, in addition, it's been boosted by strength in the mining and energy sector that, uh, you know, along with uh, like all this investment in drilling um, and, and mining comes an awful lot of industrial activity. And, and along with that industrial activity comes freight demand. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, one of the things that to keep an eye on has been the recent decline in oil prices that, you know, you can see here in this chart that really since like the, the second half of 2017, all the way through the beginning part of 2018, there's a pretty steady increase in the price of oil uh, as it rose from under $50 a barrel up to about $75 a barrel. It, it was up to $75 uh, as late as the beginning of October. Um, but over the, the last month or so, you've really seen the, the price of oil fall off of a cliff. Uh, and it's dropped from $75 to where it's at today, which is a, a, a little bit above $50 per barrel. Um, you know, so keep in mind that like over the past year, this this rise in oil prices helped the industrial sector. If the if the price of oil you know continues uh, on this downward path or stays low like this, you're going to remove one of the key supports for industrial activity in the economy. Um, you know, so along with that, you know, keep uh, keep in mind. That, that there's an awful lot of geopolitical events that are influencing oil prices, uh, and also the pace of global growth is starting to affect uh, the price of oil as well. Yeah, one of the things we look at, um, so you, you mentioned about oil being creating de higher demand, um, uh, and I think it was actually in the other, earlier slide, is the fact that for every oil well that's drilled in the United States, it actually creates uh, additional 6,000 truckloads uh, on the front end, and uh, anywhere from 300 to 600 after that. And so, oh, it's, sorry, we, we skipped ahead. Uh, but I do want to go back to the spread between Brent and WTI, because what this chart is actually showing is the difference between global oil uh, through the Brent uh, uh, assessment and WTI, which is the West Texas Intermediate, which is the benchmark uh, index for uh, uh, U.S.-based oil and Texas-based oil specifically. Uh, and it's showing that, uh, that as that spread gets bigger, that actually is creates more demand for U.S. oil because it makes our, our oil relatively cheaper to the global oil. Well, right, and and uh, especially when you think about like the the amount of oil that we export to the rest of the world, like as long as you get this price discount um, between you know what Brent is that, what the asking price is for Brent versus WTI, uh, that creates an additional demand uh, for exported U.S. oil. Now, one of the things holding some of that back is just that we can't we can't get oil through pipelines fast <laughs> enough. Like there's a there's a significant pipeline capacity issue right now that's keeping uh, U.S. inventories high and preventing it from just being uh, shipped over the. And over it the is world. worse in Canada. I oh, mean, Canadian heavy oil is at ten dollars a barrel, oh, yeah. and so it, and that's related to the fact that it's it's very heavy to refine. Uh, as well as the transport cost of moving it from uh, the the, tar, uh, the Alberta uh, into to the U.S. supply chain. Sure. Uh, so we did mention this, uh, just the, the uh, amount as oil, domestic oil uh, production moves up, particularly in the contiguous uh, states, not including Alaska, um, uh, that as that increases, that increases the amount of truckloads. We have been just amazed looking at the data on how many truckloads uh, are created for every oil well that's uh, uh, drilled. And that's things like sand and chemicals and water and et cetera, and piping that goes into that, just all the exploration that takes. Uh, and then what also happens is it creates ongoing demand uh, as oil continues to be pumped and, and uh, out of those wells. And so it is an enormous part of our economy uh, and it is something that we're watching intently. Um, the other thing that, that I don't think we have it in this particular slide, but one of the things is that the uh, back in 2014, the cost for domestic oil was in the mid 40s, if not 50, for some of the, the well companies. That price has gone down, uh, some estimates in the low 30s, and I've even heard that in certain parts of, of the oil supply chain, it's in the low 20s. And so sure. uh, the cost has become much more efficient to actually drill a well, and that will uh, sort of keep that uh, market somewhat healthy for the for, for time being. Sure. Um, yes, but I mean, again, this, this is what I consider like one of the risk areas for the industrial sector. Uh, and so this idea of, you know, we pay pretty close attention to like how much crude oil is being produced, looking for some kind of downturn uh, that, that would suggest that, you know, that there's just less activity going on and a, a very important part of that, uh, of that part of the economy. 
So one of the things that we've also dug into, we recently announced a partnership with the Tropical Carriers Association. Uh, TCA is the largest uh, organization representing uh, truckload carriers specifically, uh, and mm -hmm. they've been collecting benchmarking data uh, from across their carrier base. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is the idea of net fuel expense. Net fuel expense is the cost of fuel uh, minus any surcharge recoveries uh, for a trucking company. So that's what the net means. Um, and what we've seen is that over the last year, uh, as oil has continued to increase, uh, that that's the actual uh, percent uh, uh, on on a per or the uh, uh, pennies per mile it's cost of carriers is actually uh, stayed somewhat flat. And the reason that is and come down is that trucks are more efficient. Uh, they have been able to uh, enforce fuel surcharges. Uh, they've been able to create optimization technology to route uh, their trucks to to better locations. Uh, and so forth, and all of that sort of uh, paying dividends and how the carriers are thinking about it. Now, I will say something. It doesn't mean that the carriers are necessarily making money as oil goes up. It just means that they've somewhat hit neutrality. In fact, when you look at the, the numbers, they're not seeing uh, significant increases as oil go up, nor are they seeing significant decreases because they've somewhat mitigated the cost of oil. So just taking a look at where I see the, the industrial sector going next year, um, I mean, again, you can see like the acceleration in, in industrial production over the past year and, and some change as the economy kind of gained some momentum. Uh, like the economy overall, I think I think next year is going to be a bit more challenging. Um, generally speaking, I still think domestic demand is going to be pretty strong, which should sustain manufacturing activity overall in the economy. Um, but again, I'm concerned about oil prices. I'm concerned about uh, sort of how strong the rest of the world is growing, and also concerned about the strength of the of, of the U.S. dollar, which affects how much we export to the rest of the world. Uh, all of this is going to have some. Uh, it's going to play a role in sort of uh, how strong the industrial sector grows next year. Um, but again, I, I think gradually you'll start to see industrial production, like other things, begin to moderate a bit uh, towards what I would consider like a long-term trend for the sector. Uh, shifting gears and taking a look at the retail sector, um, you know, here I have just retail sales growth year over year. Um, it's it's been choppy over the past year and some change. There's been some good months and some bad months, but generally speaking, I think retail has has grown about as uh, uh, along the same pace as like the the overall economy. You can see the gradual acceleration in retail growth over the past year and some change. Um, the past couple months have seen the year over year growth rates come down, but again, I think this has more to do with just tough comparisons to last year than any real slowdown in the retail sector necessarily. Uh, the holiday season is now underway. Some of the early results from from sort of Thanksgiving uh, weekend and Cyber Monday have been pretty strong, especially for e-commerce. Uh, Black Friday again saw really strong growth year over year. Um, and, and the early reports from, from Cyber Monday say close to like eight billion dollars worth of of online shopping in a single day. And one thing I sorry to interrupt, but one thing I did see was that uh, the e-commerce has now, uh, in terms of Black Friday, has actually bigger is bigger than what uh, in-store sales were. That's right, that's right, and it's um it's an interesting kind of trend because you saw like the Black Friday numbers come in significantly higher than last year, but anything that that deals with like, actual foot traffic. Is showing that there's actually less people walking through stores. I mean, have you gone to the mall? Like, yeah. no, I haven't been to the mall. But if you like, we, we in Chattanooga, we have to, that's where all the restaurants are. So, like, <laughs> at least out where I live. But you, it, in the old days, you couldn't get to the mall. You would avoid it during the month of November, or December. Today, it's it's like this is just it's an afterthought. That's right. Um, and and you know that of course brings some pretty significant implications for the the carrier side of things, right? Uh, especially for people that are involved in like parcel uh, delivery. Um, or, or like LTL, like these guys, they're the ones that are going to be asked to, you know, do the, the last mile delivery on a lot of that stuff. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, like, as the holiday season goes on, how well they're able to keep up with all this demand that's out there. I, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but one of the things I do want to talk about when we're done is if, if e-commerce is taking that big of a spread and Amazon is growing exponentially, just to, their share is growing faster than, than a lot of others, what does that mean for sort of the common carrier that may that may not have as much exposure? Sure. So particularly when companies like Amazon sort of insource it. So sure. we'll, we'll hold that thought, but I do want to dive into that. Sure. Um, but broadly speaking, again, I think retail has done well along with the rest of the economy over the last couple of years. As you go into next year, 
um, you know, you're going to start to find some headwinds. Again, you're not going to get the same boost in 2019 as you did from 2018 from the tax cuts uh, that were put in, in, into place. But you also have to worry about things like rising interest rates as the Federal Reserve gets a little bit tighter with their monetary policy. This next wave of, of tariffs that are scheduled to hit in 2019, they're probably going to affect consumer prices a lot more than the initial waves of tariffs have. Uh, and so you, you're going to start to see like higher um, price levels for a lot of uh, typical consumer goods. And all of that's going to take a, a bit of a bite out of retail spending as you head into next year. Uh, so again, it's been, a, it's been a good year in 2018, but I think there's going to be some headwinds that begin to emerge next year. Um, on the inventory side, uh, you, you can see like over the past year and some change, inventory sales ratios have been drifting down. Uh, Part of this is just because I, I think the demand caught a lot of, of firms off guard, but it's also connected to this idea that uh, that firms are trying to get closer to the end consumer with their inventories. That if you think about like a lot of e-commerce deliveries, really they've been trying to get as, as as close as possible to the to the end consumer so that they can get things to them as quickly as possible and fulfill like you know delivery commitments. And so it, it's more expensive to hold inventory close to big cities. Uh, instead of like in the middle of nowhere in the uh, in the country somewhere, uh, and, and in an effort to try and mitigate some of those inventory inventory costs, you started to see them hold less and less uh, inventory, especially at retail locations. Um, I will I would bring a little bit of note to the last couple of months, which has seen an uptick in in the inventory sales ratio. I think some of that has to do with uh, concerns over tariffs, uh, like the I mean it, in the import data. Uh, and in some of the anecdotal evidence, you, I mean, you hear plenty of stories of, com of companies that are just bringing in more inventories than they normally would right about now, um, in an effort to try and to try and get things into the U.S. before extra tariffs take hold next year. Um, I think there's some of that going on right now. It, it probably continues uh, through November and December. Um, but you, you should see some elevated inventory levels as a result. One of the things I found out, um, we have a we have a close relationship with Prologis. They said that uh, their warehouses are 87 percent used. So optimal is 85, but but there's been so much demand and so much product that as people have advanced tariffs, that their uh, utilization inside the warehouse is up to 87 percent. So. Um, so one of the things uh, that we've we've asked Convo to do in, in, in partnership with this particular uh, presentation is to provide some data from their internal metrics. Um, and so they've they've done that. Uh, they have something called the Convoy Market Supply Index, uh, which is really an indication of sort of where things are at uh, in terms of, of just their demand data. Uh, what we're seeing right now, uh, looking at it, and they look at it on a regional basis, the West, South, Central, Midwest, Southeast, and Northeast, is that um, it looks to me, if you look at this data and it sort of matches up to the broader thing, is that um, reefer is, is certainly not as uh, uh, tight as what it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, dry van in the South Central uh, region is very, very tight uh, and carriers are in high demand. Uh, off the West Coast, uh, it looks like refrigerator just sort of uh, uh, melt out from where we saw a few weeks ago. Uh, but you're starting to see sort of uh, some, uh, as drivers have come out uh, from the house as they've stayed at home time, uh, they're starting to increase uh, demand in there, but we're still seeing a lot of tightness. Christmas trees, particularly uh, in the Pacific Northwest, are really tight, as they will be. Uh, they should be dropping off pretty pretty quickly because there's a very finite cycle for that. Uh, and then there's high demand for holiday uh, food goods uh, as well. So a lot of stuff happening in the market, um, and, and that's how they're, that's the data that they're currently seeing. So just taking a look at where I see retail going again over the next year or, year or so, um, I mean, I mentioned earlier that this was a pretty good year for retail. It was helped a bit by, by the tax cuts that were put into place at the start of the year. Uh, and as you go into 2019, some of that's going to go away. Like, the, you know, there's, there's not an additional tax cut. Um, and some of these some of these other headwinds like rising interest rates uh, and the tariffs, as I mentioned earlier, are going to start to take a bite out of retail spending. Uh, so project uh, retail growth of about 4.6% next year, again, moderating a bit further into to 4.0% to in, in 2020. I mean, part of this is just a function of just the the idea that the expansion is getting pretty mature also, that like as, as you get into the later years of an expansion or as, as you get to these uh, these stages in the business cycle where um, the economy has been expanding for a long period of time, you also run out of a lot of pent-up demand. So like, you know, all the things that people – held off on buying when economic conditions were were weaker um 
they kind of unleash gradually over the uh, in the years following, uh, and, and eventually you just run out of it. So like those, you know, when you look at like the auto industry um, or furniture and things and things of that nature, like a, a lot of that pent up demand that was held up when the economy was weaker has, has already been spent, uh, and you start to get into a holding pattern that that just shows uh, more modest growth. And I think that's where we're kind of headed. Is that, is that what's happening with housing? I know we're gonna get there, but. Well, I mean, housing has some uh, some uh, some kind of there, there are definitely constraints on the on the supply side. Housing actually, I think, is is one of the areas where there is some pent up demand left. Like if you look at like the amount of houses that uh, that people are buying now, it's way below where it was like a decade ago uh, or something more than that uh, before the before the recession. Um, and and so you know if you're looking for areas where there's some pent up demand left, housing is not a bad place to to look. Uh, and, and and housing, <laughs> right? And so um, this just shows housing starts in the economy. Um, housing been one of the one of the real disappointing areas of economic activity throughout the course of 2018. As we got into the you know towards the end of 2017, I think the general feeling was that housing was finally ready to take off um, because it, there were some really strong housing numbers in October, November, December headed into the year, uh, and you know, it really just hasn't materialized that way. And then it, it kind of makes the end of 2017 look like it was all just rebuilding after the hurricane and not necessarily any takeoff there. Um, on the housing side, again, there's there's some there's some supply issues for sure. Housing is, is very similar to the trucking industry in that they are having a hard time finding qualified workers to, to build the houses that they want to build. Um, they also, there's, there's also a shortage of just lots available to build houses on, and that's helping to constrain just the overall supply uh, in, in the economy. But there's also some demand problems that seem to be emerging. Um, when you look at home price data, it's, it's starting to ease up a little bit, which, which would suggest that demand is dying down for housing as well. Uh, and part of that has to do with just rising interest rates in the economy. Um, and all of that just, you know, combined leads to a housing sector that that's uh, fell well short of of expectations. Now, I, I included a much longer history in this chart just to show you exactly how far below we are of, of, of kind of pre-recession peaks. Now, there's there's some reason to believe that we you know we may never get back to those that, those paces that, that pace seen uh, in the 2004-2005 era. Uh, there's some demographic issues that are that are at play in the housing market as well. Um, but I mean, again, I think if you're looking for a place where there's some pent up demand, housing's not a bad place uh, to, to start because I don't think that people are, are buying like they normally would. Um, and, and connected to that, I mean, you can see that in the rail traffic. Uh, this here is, is lumber and wood shipments uh, or, or, uh, that's being put on rail. Uh, and you know, along with the weakness in housing, you've seen just like a deterioration in the volume in lumber and wool and wood rail shipments. Um, these things are tied very heavily to construction. So if the housing market is doing well, you usually see an uptick there. If it's doing poorly, uh, you, you you see a bit of a downturn. So no no surprise here that uh, the amount of lumber being shipped around is coming what, down. One of the data points uh, you think about lumber and you think about steel and piping as well as oil. Uh, flatbed carriers are unproportionately exposed to both construction and the oil market, sure. so they they're probably going to be feeling a lot more pain than than perhaps some of the other parts of the uh, trucking economy right now. Sure. Um, and so the, the outlook um, the outlook here actually looks a lot different than, than most of my other charts, which show like a moderation over the over the next couple of years. Uh, again, I still feel like there's some room to grow here for housing starts uh, and construction activity. Um, there are some structural things that have to be dealt with within the housing industry, which I don't think are going to be going away anytime soon. And so this this pace of, of growth in housing starts um, is still pretty modest. I mean, uh, there's a gradual acceleration all the way up until about, uh, about one and a half million units by the end of 2020. Um, but a lot of that is, just, I think it could be stronger. It's just that there's going to be this idea of not being able to find qualified labor and develop lots. Um, it's gonna it's gonna kind of keep things pretty muted until then. So shifting gears and taking a look at trade, um, it's it's been a real pain to to kind of uh, glean what the underlying trends are in trade recently. Uh, all of the noise being caused by tariff policy and just uh, the threats of, of of upcoming tariffs have really distorted a lot of the trade da data over the past several months. I mean, if you think about it, like the first announcement of tariffs was 
at the end of February of this year. And since then, it's just been like a, a, a series of just like one tariff related fluctuation after another. Uh, here's the export side of the economy, which was growing pretty healthy um, all, already in, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, but then you saw a big spike in, in export activity uh, all the way up until about June and July of this year. Now, there's no coincidence that, that that's when uh, China began imp uh, implementing tariffs on a lot of the U.S. Agric agricultural products. And so you saw this surge in export activity um, in the run-up to the, to the implementation of these tariffs uh, from China. Um, and on the other end of it, like once the tariffs get implemented, you can see just a bit of a, a, a bit of a decline in export performance since then. Um, again, it's really tough to see sort of like what the underlying trend is. Uh, and it's unfortunate because there are some fundamentals at play as well. Um, you know, when you think about like the, the market for U.S. exports, tariffs, they play a role, but also you have to consider like how strong global growth is. Uh, a healthy growing global economy is good news for U.S. exports. Um, and then also what the strength of the U.S. dollar is. Like the U.S. dollar has also gotten stronger over the past couple of months. That has negative implications for, for U.S. exports. And so it's, it's very tough to, to determine like how much of this is really just tariffs, how much of it is, is, is sort of these fundamentals that are at play. Uh, on the import side, there's some similar things happening right now. Uh, again, trade policy seems to be driving some of the surge that we've been seeing in imports over the past couple of months. Um, and it's, it's making it a little bit difficult to understand like what the, what the underlying fundamentals are for, for import demand. Again, um, when you look at like the, the appetite for U.S. imports, you have to consider how fast the U.S. economy is growing. Uh, it, it's been performing well over the past couple of quarters, so that would encourage imports. Uh, but then also a strong dollar encourages imports. It makes goods from the rest of the world cheaper. Uh, and so as the, as the dollar gets stronger, you, you want to bring in more uh, goods from the rest of the world. And so that's also playing a role in some of these strong import numbers. Um, again, I, I think a lot of the recent stuff has been tariff related. There, there, there seems to be a feel that a lot of companies are bringing in goods earlier than they otherwise might. What that means is that as you get to the other end of these tariffs, which are scheduled to take place in the beginning of 2019, there's probably going to be a drop off in import volume uh, as a result, similar to what we saw on the export side earlier this year. Uh, yeah, so looking at the trade outlook, um, again, I, I think tariffs are playing a role here, but Fundamentals are, are are always going to be the key. Uh, that you know you can imp you can institute a bunch of tariffs on goods from the rest of the world, but if U.S. if the U.S. economy is growing strong and the U.S. dollar is, is growing at a, at a healthy clip, you're going to import anyway. Um, so I, I have projections of of imports still outstripping exports all through 2019 and 2020. Export growth of about 4% next year, uh, in, improving to 5% in 2020. Import growth of about 6% over the next couple of years here. Um, just a, a couple quick uh, risk areas for, for demand. Uh, again, the tariffs that are scheduled to increase again in 2019. This probably doesn't make a big difference for, from a U.S. growth perspective, uh, but it has pretty big implications for transportation markets. Um, you know, on the U.S. growth side, like anytime, if there's tariffs involved, uh, if there's a hike up in tariffs and companies have already imported a bunch and put it in their inventories, all that means in the first quarter is that you're going to import less, which is good for GDP, but you're also going to draw down from inventories, which is bad for GDP, and it kind of cancels itself out. Um, but from a transportation perspective, that means that if you're, if you're involved in the import side of things, you should, I expect to see, again, in the beginning part of the year, much less import volume uh, than we otherwise might have, uh, and a lot more movements back and forth from inventory. And that, that probably also means a lot of spot volatility, uh, because if you have that inconsistent demand you're going to have when markets are really soft is is they're not it's just going to create sort of this artificial volatility in the market yeah i mean it, um i think when you look at just 2018 overall into 2019 volatility is going to be part of it just because so many of the normal things that we're used to seeing in the trucking market have been disrupted by all of this stuff like there's been demand where there normally isn't uh and then there's no demand when there normally <laughs> is right and, and it, it's just made everything a lot more volatile and there's, and there's, there's no history to sort of i mean at least in the modern age to sort of look at how this is all being impacted right exactly um so a couple other risk areas Federal Reserve seems to be on track for a couple more, uh, a few more rate increases next year. I mentioned that this is, has implications for consumer spending. Um, the Fed recently has been a little bit uh, more dovish 
on on how fast they're going to increase interest rates. I think they're they're getting a little bit concerned about how fast the U.S. economy is going to slow down next year, um, and so they, you know, they, I think they're going to be very data dependent. But I still expect that rates are going to be higher next year. Uh, and then the third thing, as I've mentioned a few times so far, is that um, there's a lot of cracks showing in the global economy. That China China's <clears throat> economy seems to be slowing down, especially their manufacturing sector. Um, Europe seems to be dealing with the, you know, they're finally faced with the reality of, of having the UK leave the European Union. That's causing a slowdown there. And uh, I think all of this uh, becomes a pretty big risk area for how it spills over into the US economy. So let's talk freight. Um, you know, it has been a very unusual year. Uh, if you look at, uh, the, so these big dips are holidays, so we ignore them because they're sort of irregular. Uh, periods that don't uh, they don't change the direction of the market they change sort of the periods and this is a an index that looks at total freight volume electronic freight volume tender volume in the market um, you see uh, in the summer we had a huge sort of inflated amount of activity typical summers are big uh, this one was really really big uh, we baseline this chart at 10,000 so the index itself is 10,000 it doesn't mean 10,000 loads it just means the index itself is 10,000 from a measurement standpoint so if you go to 11,000 that's a 10 percent increase and 9,000 is a 10 percent decrease and so what you're looking at here is the total as a measurement of the total amount of freight transactions you saw that we had this really strong end of the first quarter sort of a lull in second quarter uh, uh, into sort of late May then a surge uh, to J uh, June and July, summer softening, and really the market sort of stabilized in that July, August, uh, and September period. And then we saw something really strange. And I've had this uh, actually said to me by a few CEOs is, it's almost like we got into October and somebody turned off the faucet. It was like October 1st, the market in terms of demand started to really, really slow down. Now that has a lot of implications as it relates to spot pricing, we saw Wall Street sell off about that time. Uh, and so we've seen a, a, a pretty tremendous impact uh, to just declining volumes. And what is really odd about this chart is that typically in late October and into November, you would see higher uh, than average volumes for the rest of the year. And we just didn't see peak. And so the November peak that we would typically see has actually been much softer. Uh, than we expected. I think most projections for the market uh, was that we would have a much stronger November. We have not seen that. The one exception to that has been Southern California, which has been on fire related to the ports. It's always sort of strong, uh, but this year, uh, rel relative to the rest of the market, has been incredibly uh, strong. Markets like Chicago and Atlanta have been uh, largely flat and softer, and Dallas as well. So, interesting to see what happens. Um, looking at how this impacts it, so it, volume is one side of the transaction, the other is uh, capacity and the willingness for carriers to accept loads. Uh, we look at the uh, outbound tender reject, we call OTRI, uh, which is basically uh, an index that measures whether uh, truck, truckers have accepted loads or have rejected loads. Uh, the higher the rejection rate, uh, the tighter the capacity, and we've, we saw very similar Volume was softer. There has been an increase in capacity, and we saw from really October that October fall you saw uh, uh, fall that you saw in volume. Uh, you also had incremental capacity had been increased in the market over the last couple of months, and that exacerbated the uh, tender rejection volume. That also will have a softening impact on spot rates, which we've seen uh, with what DAT has recently published. Um, the West Coast has sort of been uh, uh, insulated from this. It's always insulated uh, in the fourth quarter. It's always strong. Uh, this year is no different. Uh, the uh, uh, tender volume index has just been has been rocking uh, since the uh, latter uh, part of the uh, second quarter, uh, and it has continued that surge. I will say we are about at the end of that surge unless tariffs have artificially done it. And you look at the China volumes, look at container prices, they have not fallen off at all. And so typically you would see sort of that November lull drop off about right now out of California. We're not yet seeing that. And we'll, it's interesting to see how much uh, uh, the port activities really sort of artificial, artificially changed due to tariffs and tariff uh, 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 projections or, or, or angst. Um, the other thing that's happening, um, we, we, we talk about all of the different sort of sectors of the market. Uh, coal has been dropping. People look at rail. 
Uh, coal is is has historically people have associated coal with with the rail markets. That's no longer uh, the number one commodity for rail. Um, but if we sort of go through and look at how uh, it's being displaced, is the intermodal traffic has really done it now. We don't have it on the chart is showing intermodal is exponentially larger than coal or not exponentially is degrees larger than coal in terms of volume. But as coal uh, and other sort of uh, bulk commodities get displaced, what we're seeing is intermodal start to replace that. Now that's interesting for truckers because a lot of that volume uh, that are in boxes and containers that used to be on trucks are now going on intermodal. And so uh, intermodal continues to be a, 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 a very large performer in the market. And I think we'll continue to see that, especially as port volumes sort of increase. Um, we've seen it, we've mentioned spot data and spot pricing. Uh, you can see it in the data. We've not seen it in a spot inflation area part of the market, really the latter half. Uh, you've seen the market really, really drop off. Um, there is vol some volatility. Uh, it's just that the, if you think of bid ask or the top to the bottom side of the market, it's much tighter than it's been, which means the market's relatively balanced. Uh, we're not seeing a deflationary environment. You're seeing it deflationary from where we were before, but you're not seeing a really collapse of rates. You're just seeing that the high spot rates that truckers enjoyed uh, in the first half of the year, or at least the second quarter of the year, they're not currently enjoying. And we're certainly not seeing uh, the inflationary environment that we saw last year. Um, the other thing that we've, uh, in, a, in our partnership with TCA, the other thing that we started to look at is uh, the asset-based carriers have been increasingly getting into brokerage, but we're trying to understand uh, the total percent of uh, of their revenues, how much is associated with brokerage uh, volumes. And what we've seen is the latter part of the year, that that's sort of dropped off the cliff. And so uh, as much as 14% of, the, of their revenue was associated with asset-based brokerage, uh, which means brokerage inside the asset-based operation, uh, and now it's showing 6%, which is really, really a, a small percent of it. What it likely means is that as, as the market has sort of slowed down and volumes have slowed down, the trucking companies themselves are using their organic capacity to take those loads versus buying capacity from the open market. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to watch how this shows up in the data when we see fourth quarter reports. Um, I, I think we can spend a little bit of time. I don't want to spend too much on it. A GM announced yesterday, Ford announced something a couple of months ago that they were getting out of the sedan business for the most part. A GM yesterday announced that they were also uh, getting out of uh, a number of sedans. Uh, we actually looked at the data. We have some of the automotive data. Detroit, uh, about 57,000 cars are assembled related to this particular plant. Um, to put this in perspective, uh, they, they shut down three plants. One was in Canada, two were in North America and in the United States. One was in Detroit and one was in Warren, Ohio, which is outside of Cleveland. Um, this is the, the actual part of the market. Uh, so I don't think from a Detroit, uh, Detroit produces a lot of cars. Uh, it's not going to have as big of an impact, but this particular plant in Cleveland actually will have a much bigger impact relative to the market. Now, it is 10% of General Motors' total car volume, the cars that they produce. So it is a sizable uh, dent to GM. Relative to the entire U.S. production, it's only 2%. But one thing that I, we've talked about earlier before we got on this call is that I think there is a cultural shift, or, or at least a demographic shift, in how people are buying automo automobiles. And we'll probably see other structural changes in the automobile sector. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think when you look at like the auto industry, especially for sedans like i think the sales for sedans probably peaked a couple of years ago like in, in 2014 the early part of 2015 that that sort of time frame um u.s consumers are still kind of buying they're buying cars but mostly what they buy are like suvs these days like the the, the light uh, light suvs instead of sedans um and there's this kind of preference away from just car ownership that i think is a longer term kind of trend uh that will steer away from just uh, surges in, in auto sales going forward Um, yeah, so I, I think that's going to be interesting to watch and see how that ends up. Um, the other thing is, uh, talking to some of the auto manufacturers and OEMs, what they're talking about is that Netflix model, or pay like pay a flat monthly fee and get sort of cars a service, or automotive as a service, and we'll see how that ends up. Um, what are the other thing that we tried to do? So to un we've talked about volume, spent a lot of time on it. Um, the other side of this equation is capacity or supply, and so we've talked about the demand side. Let's talk about the 
supply side. One of the key indicators is employment. Um, and we have, we've created our own estimate, which is taking fundamental data and sort of estimating it uh, and then baseline against the government. The nice thing about having uh, the data that we've created or the estimate is it's, it's basically daily. We, we, we take and estimate it on a daily basis, looking at some of the data that we've got. Uh, the government data uh, sort of is at a lag. It's what a, what a 30 day lag, 40 day lag. Uh, and so uh, what, what is interesting is, according to the data that we're getting, is it looks like sort of truck and employment has peaked for now, at least for this year. I don't think it's peaked uh, uh, long term, but this year it doesn't look like there has been an increase in driver employment. And I wonder if that's related to warehousing and other jobs that people could get, just seasonality as people should drop off. It also might be a function of just the, the softer volume in the market is that people uh, uh, relative to smaller fleets are not are not getting in there because they're finding the, the economics are, are tougher. Yeah, I mean, and there's a there's definitely a seasonal component to a lot of this stuff. Like normally, when you look at trucking hires, um, November December aren't the strongest months for for bringing on uh, new drivers and things of that nature. I think when you look longer term, like into 2019, um, again, I still kind of expect overall demand to be a bit above average. Um, and so as a result, I think that the, the trucking industry is going to keep hiring workers. And, and I expect that, uh, you know, as part of a broader tightness in the overall labor market, it's going to be hard for, for uh, carriers to find qualified workers still in, in 2019. But they are finding them. I mean, we're, we're seeing sure, that they sure. are finding them, even when they uh, we know that it's tight, but they are able to find some. Well, I mean, you, you can find anybody if you raise the wages high enough. <laughs> like, uh, uh, no disrespect to Craig, but if they if they pay drivers enough, like I'll go drive a truck. Right. So, <laughs> I, I, we, you could do your economic the road. <laughs> that, that's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and that's partially what we've seen throughout the course of 2018. That like um, demand hit in a big way, and carriers were like, okay, we need to bring in more drivers, and so they went out and they raised wages. Uh, and it's not all that surprising that more drivers have come on board, and it, it it's going to be tough. Um, and again, you're, you're gonna, there'll be a lot of competition because there's a lot of industries that are going to be looking for workers, but it, it's possible with the, with the right amount of wages, and I expect that, that kind of trend to continue in the next year. Um, so, yeah, just to, just to sum up overall um, what we've been talking about today, again, I, I think as long as the current policy environment stays the way that it is, uh, the economy is, is probably going to start moving back down to trend. I mean, and by the current policy environment, I mean the fact that there's like no no additional tax cuts in in play, no infrastructure spending uh, project that's that's uh, in the works, um, and you have these tariffs that are on the horizon that are going to take a bit of a bite out of growth. Uh, as long as that's the case, you're going to start to see a slowdown in growth uh, next year. Next year is still above average. You know that 2.6 percent. That's better than average growth still, even if it's not as good as 2018. Um, I would say that there's a, there's still a little bit of upside risk to the to the outlook. Um, I haven't given up all hope that all this tariff noise is really just noise, and that we, that uh, a lot of this stuff will go away. Um, there's a pretty big meeting between uh, President Xi and, and and President Trump at the end of this month, um, which will go a long way into determining how how the trade policy looks going forward. Uh, and if things get resolved, then you're looking at a bit of a, a brighter picture. Um, I would also say that I think the likelihood of an overall recession is pretty low. Um, you know, in my view, these days, in order to get like a full-fledged recession, you need something that kind of hits the, old, the like multiple sectors of the economy all at once. Um, so, like, I mean, a massive stock decline worse than what we've already experienced could do something like that. The yield curve inverts for one reason or another that can do that that sort of thing. But a lot of the sort of the traditional culprits, like an oil price shock. Um, I don't think that's enough to push us into recession anymore. Uh, and I think the trucking industry probably remains strained. Like I, like I said, I think it's going to be, um, there's, there's still going to be a, a condition where you have to add more drivers uh, going forward, and it's going to be tough to do so. But I don't think it's going to be as bad as, as 2018. You should feel less pressure in 2019 relative to, to 2018, partially because capacity has already been increasing. And the other part is that demand is not going to grow as at, at as strong of a pace next year as it did uh, in, in 2018. So when you say strain, you mean capacity strain? Yes, capacity strain, yes. All right. Um, Marianne? Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your insight. So at this point, we will move right on to the Q&A. If you have not already submitted your questions, please do so through the Q&A button in your control panel. First question um, along the lines of the tariffs. 
Trump has been rumored to be adding additional tariffs as early as next week on auto, in addition to the one-to-one -one increase. Do you believe that that will have a further impact on freight? Um, so I mean, the easy answer to that is yes. If, if, if it takes place, then then yes. All of these tariffs, uh, in one way or another, that like none of them are positive, and none of them have zero effect overall. Uh, it's really just a question of like how big of a deal is it. Um, for the auto industry, I think it's a it's a pretty big deal. Um, tariffs have, have have definitely taken a bite out of uh, overall autom automotive uh, the automotive environment. Um, from an overall economic perspective, I I still think tariffs just in general aren't aren't huge enough to to make that big of a difference growth wise. Okay. And is it commonplace for flatbeds to feel Still available capacity hauling containers, especially in areas with port volume. You know, that's an interesting question. It's chassis, right? So flatbed, the way we think, I mean, flatbed is sort of a, a catch-all for um, uh, uh, trucks that that are, are, don't have boxes around them. But uh, really, the in the container uh, side of it, in the ports, it's it's really related to uh, 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 having chassis. And there has been a chassis shortage. There's been a lot of issues at the ports themselves and getting chassis this year as port volumes have increased. And so uh, there are a number of companies trying to solve for that. But, but I, as I understand the last checks is um, it has gotten better, uh, but we're still at a point where uh, chassis are, are somewhat tight and, and irregularly distributed as uh, port uh, activity has changed and fluctuated with sort of like the Panama Canal. So the East Coast ports are having have had bigger issues now with what's happened with China uh, off the West Coast is sort of impacted as well. Great. And then when looking at industry fleet capacity, do people look at tonnage or ATA versus a rolling eight to 10 year class eight retail sales, or do they look at some sort of loadings data instead? I, I, can you rephrase that question, or can you repeat that question? I yeah, say. yeah. It, it it looks like they're asking when you're looking at overall industry fleet capacity, um, should they be should people be looking at tonnage or ATA well, versus? Well, so yeah. so there's tonnage, which is demand, right? So the tonnage report, the survey, sent out to fleet executives that come back and talk mm -hmm. about just overall demand. Um, it is it is valuable to sort of benchmark where we've been. There's another index, CAS, uh, CAS which is a billing company uh, bank that does uh, bill payment uh, or, or bill uh, auditing. Uh, they also create a shipping, shipment index based on total bill flow. We have a volume index based on electronic transactions. They're all different. They're all done different. One is survey-based, which is the ATAs. Uh, one is billing base, which is CASs, which takes in billing transactions, and the other is uh, our volume index, which is based on electronic transactions. Ours is going to be the very first one because it's within 24 hours. Um, I don't know what the cadence of ATAs is in terms of how fast they get their data versus when they report it. I suspect it's probably on a 30-day lag, because, a 30 to 45-day lag because it's survey. Uh, and then CAS is being billing, just look at a billing cycle, you're probably 30 to 45 days out as well. So when you look at volume, it's important to understand that there's a lot of different metrics for it. Uh, we like the electronic volume because it's, it's sort of real time. Um, as it relates to capacity, so that tells you volume, you have to answer the question about capacity, which then is much more difficult. I like the employment uh, uh, factors, even if you, even if we know that there are independents growing, uh, it's still the employment data sort of shows a relative increase because it shouldn't grow uh, at, at about the same level, if not faster. And so, yeah, and I would add that, like, I feel like on the capacity side, the real bottleneck is the drivers. It's not, it's not that, uh, you know, we have plenty of drivers and not enough trucks to move this stuff around. It's it's usually like we have enough trucks, we just can't find drivers. And a lot of the the new orders that you see of of, of Class A trucks and uh, and things like that, uh, you, you know, there's a good amount of that that's really just replacement to try and entice drivers in there. Like you know, if you want to bring drivers on uh, and they're not responding to like higher wages in the way that you might like, uh, one of the ways you can do it is by promising that they can drive the you know the, the the best new trucks that are out there. And that's awesome. Like when you do your next economic report in a truck, you, you'll you the new Cascadia. <laughs> that's, 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 will, right. Uh, uh, that's, that's right. You'll have some Wi-Fi or something like that <laughs> that I can, I can broadcast from. No, that's a, that's a good point because I, I think the employment numbers is probably the most reliable sort of barometer of it. The truck volume is replacements and uh, and so employment number. Now, trailers are also interesting as a data point. Yes. Um, you know, and, and Craig brought up a, a pretty interesting point that the employment numbers don't capture everything. Like there's a 
the BLS, when they do their surveys of like employment, uh, all they're doing is like counting the people that are on payrolls uh, for the most part, uh, at least for the industry data. Um, and so there's a whole part of, you know, there's a, a chunk of people that, have, that don't, that aren't on payrolls anywhere, and you really don't get a whole lot of visibility in there. Um, but I think directionally, they, they at least speak to trends in the industry. Uh, so I, I, I also, uh, I, I like the employment numbers. Too. Yeah, I mean, it's about as, and, and then people argue that independence is getting in. It is true that it's, it's never been easier to be an independent trucker. Volumes are strong. Uh, the various entries, people like Convoy and some of the other uh, services that are out there, it's, it's quite easy for someone to leave a fleet. The challenge, though, as a small fleet operator is not all of them have the credit credentials to go buy a truck. And therefore, uh, even the small fleets will end up having drivers that work for them, which will show up in the employment data. Great. And next question, how do you reconcile continued sequential strength in contractual dry van truckload rates versus sequential softening in transactional or spot rates? Yeah, that's a great question. So they look a little bit counter, right? So we're seeing contract rates go up. We're seeing spot rates go down. Now, let me let me say this. I hate the word contract and spot, even though we use them. We'll use them. They're somewhat misleading. Spot is spot. Contract is um, can mean a lot of different things. Mo most of the time, it means I have a rate on file, or the, the shipper has a rate on file with a carrier. What it doesn't tell you is inside those contract rates, whether they're, you're in the first position or the fifth position. So the variance of paying the lowest guy on the route guide, let's could be 100% in some cases. But so I, I have Ibrahim, I'm gonna pay a dollar a mile. He turns it down. I got a John Paul, he's a buck 20, he turns it down. I've got a Marianne, you're at a buck 50, you'll take it. I pay 50% more, but in all of our minds, we've stayed in contract because that was a contract rate uh, that you got and uh, that was a contract rate uh, that I'm paying. And so it's hard to look at contract rate to understand everything about the market. But what happens is these contract rates are typically set 12 months they're on rolling 12 months averages. And what happens is there's a, there's a combination of mix on how, what freight the carriers take at that point in time, as well as uh, contract rates uh, of when they actually go through bid cycle. And so what you'll see is those contract rates will stay fairly, st they'll increase year over year is what people look at, but they're gonna stay fairly consistent throughout the year in terms of the increase until you go through the bid cycle next year. Where you see the volatility is in, is in those spot rates. But regardless of whether a fleet, I always hear the trucking CEOs talk, well, I only have 5% or 10% in spot. They're exposed to spot because spot is direction of price regardless of what's happening. And kind of based on where we are in the market now, um, do you see any implications for shipper versus carrier leverage in the 2019? I, it's gonna be interesting to play out because uh, if Ibrahim's right and we're not headed to really sort of, the, if you take the negative view and we're not into a recession, it's probably going to be that the carriers are going to get some level of increase, um, at least uh, two to three percent. I, I would say that we're probably at the low lower side of rate increases. Uh, Morgan Stanley reported about uh, 45 days ago that, that in their survey they were projecting seven percent year over year rate increases. No way that happens unless we have a, a, a demand shock where all of a sudden something happens or a black swan event that really causes excess demand. Don't know what it could be at this time of year. Uh, I don't think you'll see a significant year-over-year -year rate increases. I'm thinking probably 3% is the high number um, for like consistent. Now, we have to be careful because a lot of things impact that number in terms of freight selection. Some lanes that are tweener, that are inefficient, are going to pay higher. Some lanes may see discounts. And so, But a general rule is I think 3% is about as, as much as I would expect it. I think we've got time for maybe one more question here. Um, if you have submitted questions or want to continue to do so, please feel free to. We will follow up with you after the live webinar. Um, so are you seeing more carriers move toward an increased supply of trailers to deal with hours of service and ELD regulations? And if so, is this changing any of the pricing models for rating, both in flatbed and van space? Well, the asset-based carriers have always had some of an advantage over the 3PLs and the fact that they own tradables because it means that drivers are not having to do live load. They're not having to wait for their trailers to be uh, unloaded, et cetera. And so the asset-based carriers have sort of had the advantage here uh, of being able to run freight in and out. The, lar the large guys with, with large trailer pools have been able to run freight in and out uh, without detaining their drivers. I think some of the 3PLs, are starting to wake up to that and starting to address it. Convoys got their shared trailer pool, and I think that gives them the advantage to sort of 
uh, at least compete uh, in certain cases against some of the larger asset carriers. And what that does is it makes it more attractive for someone to empower only moves, uh, someone that wants to be a part of Convoy's network or some of the other uh, uh, operations out there. They can not, they don't have to have the trailer and they can use the shared trailer pool. And I see those innovations sort of work. Um, uh, I, I think certainly if you have a trailer pool and you, uh, as a shipper, you're willing to have trailers on your yard and you work with your carriers to pay you have an efficient way of getting trailers in and out and managing those pools, I think you have some advantages in negotiating uh, a quality rates because you're not detaining the drivers. And if I'm a shipper, I'm negotiating. In the old days, it was if you wanted trailers, it was sort of like a bad thing. I'm going to be going and saying, look, we want trailer pools. We'll pay a daily uh, trailer charge uh, to sort of hold that, but we want you to supply trailers because we want your drivers in and out. And that gives them a big advantage in the market. Great. All right, well, it looks like that is about all of the time that we have for today. So thank you to everyone who's listening in um, for your engagement, for your questions, and thank you to Craig and Ibrahim for being with us today, as well as to our partners at Convoy um, for partnering with us on this webinar series. Next month's market update webinar is scheduled for December 18th, so you can look for the registration invite in your email here in the next couple of weeks. And fresh off the heels of our Market Waves event in Texas, we are gearing up for our Transparency 19 event, which is going to take place May 6th through 8th in Atlanta. Um, today only until midnight, we have tickets available for $7.95 each. These normally go for $24.95, so it will not get better than this. If you're interested, please do feel free to reach out today. Um, and it looks like that's about all we've got. You can also reach or uh, visit www.transparency19.com to register uh, for the Transparency 19 event. So thank you all again for joining us today, and we hope you'll be with us again next month. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, Marianne.